so uh, the first thing I wanted I put there. The first thing I wanted to talk about when we are talking about the language and the basic question, can animals have language, is we have to address uh, the almost obsessive nature of the language question and its definition. Uh, today, if you are looking at what we call the more traditional definition of the language, it is, for example, language, the aptitude observed in all humans to communicate through tongues. So can animal have language? No, because human is in the definition. Is it a good reason? Not really. We have to address that. What is the tongue? The tongue here is any vocal sign system with double articulation that is proper to a specific human community. So again, it's really easy to answer a question if you are putting the answer inside the question, but it's not a scientific way to answer a question. And um, we'll say at the end of uh, Jacobson, in reality, most recent disagreements are partially due to differences in terminology and partially due to a different allocation of linguistic problems chosen and highlighted by researchers. Such selection can sometimes confine research to narrow limitation and neglected subjects that were pushed aside. The main reason we didn't for long find or why not language is animal is because we didn't want to find them. And so we didn't find them because we didn't look for it. And I will put, because it's my conference, so I have this privilege, I will put my own quotation right now. Every time someone puts language and animal in the same sentence, a long and sterile debate starts. What? Because we are not right now addressing the main point of a definition. If you want to know if something exists somewhere, you have to address the definition. Definition is a bit obsessive in language, but it's useful, I swear. So look at the main element of historical definition. First, it said that is a communication tool. That's right, that's good. But the issue is it's too broad. There is a difference between communication and language. It's difficult to say that, for example, in biosemiotics, that cells have language. That seems to be odd. We see that something is not fine, but cells do communicate between each other, between all their organisms. Uh, if cell were not able to be a communicative organism, we were not be there to ask the question. That would be very simple, more simple, maybe a bit less interesting. The other part is that it say it's a vocal thing. Why? Technically, we didn't find today uh, a real reason to see that it has to be vocal. The main reason we say that language is a vocal thing is maybe because we are vocal animals and so we put the definition on what we know about ourselves. But it's quite arbitrary. A lot of other things can exist and we will see just after that. Well, the point is the double articulation. So for the one who were maybe not uh, very familiar with that, Double articulation says that you have, you must have to have a double articulation, the phoneme, the sound, the morphine, the, I would say, the part, the scene, sign part. But clearly, when we are doing that, there is another problem, is that we are excluding some human being on the definition of language. And Excluding some human of the definition of language is highly problematical. If you are looking at, I would say, ancient classification, like the one of Guillaume March, uh, which is uh, end of the 19th century, uh, deaf and mute people are classified with pongidaes, that mean with the orangutan, because they were not able to talk. So now we admit that this definition is highly problematic on a highly level. Let's see a bit more. Other definition of the speech and of the language were proposed, were addressed, different criteria were proposed. And the problem that every time we made a discovery, either in ethology or in anthropology, and it just fall apart. 
The first was, again, the oral speech, but we are excluding people that are not able to have uh, oral speech. Yet there are human being able, for example, to read and to write. And if they are able to read and to write, yeah, they are able of language. Again, this double articulation. Double articulation is not always present in sign language. Um, you can have a kind of substitute because in sign language, when you are, for example, trying to explain your name or the name of a city, you can spell with a sign. But it's always it's all um, so it's something that is only available in culture like our that are an alphabet. Japanese sign language exists. The concept of alphabet for us is a foreign concept, very far away. There are way to sign this, but the double articulation is not existing in global speech. Again, goes for the arbitrary of sign. The sign must be arbitrary. That means that there is no, I would say, uh, economic of logical link between something and the sound we use to do with our mouth to design this. The problem is first, it's again excluding some human being. For example, if uh, you are using the, the sign to in sign language, in French sign language, to describe the scenario, the way you, uh, you cut different parts of a film when you are running it, a scenario is this going like this. The way scenes are cut during opening. It's not an arbitrary sign. Maybe if I mend, then you can even know what it is. Uh, and on the contrary, it also includes some animals that are not human beings. Our lung calls and every species able to do that are arbitrary sign. There is no link, absolutely, I would say, indexical or economical between the sound that a rabbit made when it fell on the ground because there is an enemy on the world and the predator itself. It's not the sound of the predator, for example. It's an arbitrary sign. Another definition was the recursivity. Recursivity is the ability to say on different things the same thing in a sentence. For example, the man is saying his wife has left. His wife, the his referred to the men that were preferred in the sentence. And he's saying something about, and this is again another subject. But some language, human language, human speech, doesn't have recursivity. That were found quite late uh, because they were quite isolated, were language. And it seemed very odd to us because we are European or from European language. European language are two family of language, three if you consider all the Turkish part being part of the Europe, they also then family, and one isolate, Basque. In uh, Latin America, there is 45 family of language and 87 isolates. The diversity of human language is more broader than what we think. Other language specific property over time, times, the ability to speak to the future, the ability to speak to the past, the color, the emotion. But in fact, rare language are exception almost everywhere. When I came from to when I came in Estonia and I tried to learn the Estonian language, all my family and friends were completely muzzled by the fact that I said Estonia don't have a proper time to talk about the future. Yet, apparently, they are a ball of language. Um, there is also a question of concept and abstraction, but other animals are also able to have complex concepts, like the concept of zero or none, like it was taught with the uh, Pepperberg experience about the, um, it's a kind of parrot, a big gray parrot, and I have, uh, I don't, I'm not sure right now of the name in English. Uh, the parrot was called Alex, this one, and it's, uh, would say a bird that is known for its final intelligence and ability to learn, and to learn concepts like none or zero. And also the innovation and creation, you can do things in the language that are uh, innovative, 
when a new thing appears and we don't have a word for that, we invent a new word, design the new thing. But this also happens when you are teaching other, I would say, intermediate language to other species to talk to them. Uh, in some of the sign language experience in ape, we have some ape that invited a sign that were not existent before because they had to design something that we were not taught the sign for. So what are we doing with that? Well, first, it's important to recognize that at this point, there is an ideological purpose in the definition of language. It can be because it's the proof of the soul. Okay, it can be, seems a bit odd, but I swear to you that when sign language were first invented, it was invented by a Christ. And it was because he wanted to prove that deaf people can go in heaven because they can learn the Bible if they have a language and so they have a soul. It can seem a bit odd, but well, it, it, it was centuries ago, but have this in mind. It has also been that the language was thought and was think about as being a propre de l'homme, a human uniqueness. So on this point, I will quote uh, our uh, fellow colleague Ratasep on this point, the trait of criteria for determining human uniqueness are mental, already suitable to the mental. Something against like smallpox will not do as indicator of human uniqueness. What is the prop of the law? Maybe the measles, but it's not interesting and it's prop. And it's important to see that a lot of these definitions are trying to show a gap rather than a continuity. But is it really a good way to think about the language? What is the language, biologically, evolutionary speaking? So let's see what happens if we are thinking on the other way. Because it's not you know, the, the point to say continuity for continuity. The point is that if we are thinking it of a continuity, what can we learn? What can we learn of this definition that when there are thought to be a gap is not working? Well, first we have to acknowledge that language is a complex tool. Tools can be studied from an evolutionary perspective. How it appeared, how it complexified, how it changed, how it appeared multiple times in different ways, in different branches. Complexity is biologically costly. It requires uh, energy, it requires attention. Having a big brain is costly. Uh, your brain is 2% of your body weight, approximately, yet it consumes approximately 20% of your oxygen and 25% of your glucose. It's costly. Biological costs are disadvantaged, but disadvantage can be conserved through evolution if it comes with a stronger advantage. So for every gradation of complexity in language, we have to ask what is the cost? And what is the advantage? So let's see with an example, what is the cost and what is the advantage? And I will use a very basic example, but it will help people to understand. And we are looking inside the biology, the very own biology of our species. I will use for this example, an uh, individual of Homo sapiens species, my little brother. So, we are in a situation, imagine, south of the France years ago, my little brother is a bright kid, three years old. He is deadly allergic to wasps, like deadly. I'm a kid, but I, have seven, I am seven years old at this time, and I know that. My little brother doesn't have completely an idea of that, but he already had very painful and frightening experience with the wasp before. That's how we know he's allergic. So we have a quite traumatic sign with that, even if not. We are playing outside, kids playing in summer. And suddenly I hear him screaming. But little kids scream all the time. They can scream of excitation because they are playing, of frustration because they broke their toy, or fear. It's the emission of a simple sign and also very iconic. So what we do at this moment? There is no maybe specific destination. Probably he was have screamed by himself. What happened? But the sounds can be restructured and reconstructed. 
At this moment, so I did something our species are very brilliant at, face recognition. I look at him and I am interpreting all the sign in the space. We are very good and every primate species are very good at this. And what I see is absolute terror. So what happened at this moment? In this moment, the moment I recognized the fear on his face, the amygdala, not the queen star was the, the endocrine part in the brain, the amygdala is pumped up. That means adrenaline everywhere and prepared to the fight or flight responses. Notice that if it was in vain, this answer is very costly because adrenaline do a lot of biological modification in the body. But yet, but I have no idea what is the danger. I'm preparing myself. If it's a wasp, I will crush it with my feet. Fight once first. But if he's in a snake, I won't fight a snake. I'm prepared to grab him in my arm and run to safety, probably screaming myself because I am seven. What are we doing at this moment? A second thing our species is very good at, gaze following. Gaze following is a quite complex connective process. That means that I am able to understand that someone in this situation afraid of something is looking at it. And to understand where the danger is, I don't have to look at where the sound, the sign is produced. I have to look where he is looking, where he saw the sign making it produce this. This is a high complex cognitive process. And so I'm turning my face to all his gaze. At this moment in the brain, second thing happened. The hippocampus is, well, if you don't know, the hippocampus is a kind of the big memory book of the brain. As well as in this moment, the hippocampus is compulsing the book, ready to register every known danger and to understand how we should react to this situation. And I identify so that an insect uh, with stripes, yellow and dark, you say, okay, that's a wasp. And then something in the hippocampus would say, oh my God, no, that's three times the size of a wasp, but not a wasp. And something happened that there is no fight. I don't know what it is. There is no flight. Uh, should I fly? First response trigger in the brain, freeze. Freeze because I don't know what this thing is. Here we are also another part. The different gradation of complexity is possible. But I mean, right now we are in the dead end. He is screaming of terror and I freeze because I don't know what the hell this is. But he do something how our species is also very good at insisting. That means that he's absolutely terrified and he grabbed my hand and washed my hand like this because in his head, I am the grown up supposed to do something. And we are very sensitive to the terror of our younglings. So at this moment, the fight response was triggered. I grabbed the biggest stone I could find just near me and crashed this thing. And with adrenaline and a lot of luck, I had it. Just after that, an actual grown-up is the person of my grandfather, alerted by all this noise, came to know what the hell is going on. And I say, I just killed a giant wasp. And look at me and say, that's so rubbish. A giant wasp is not a thing that exists. And he left the stone to see what it is. Indeed, giant wasp does not exist. All nets does. That was my first encounter with a hornet. But let's see what could have happened. Imagine like right now, my little brother is not three years old. He's five, he's still able to speak, but he has also much more control on his emotion. And instead of just screaming, he screams something that is a complex sign, semi-specific. That means that instead of just screaming something, he screams something with a first alarm call, a non-specific alarm call, like help. In this situation, the moment I hear the scream, I know that it's a danger. We don't have all the first step. I am getting maybe, well, in the brain reaction, few fraction of seconds. But in the first reaction, perhaps multiple seconds. I was just near him and I wanted to check the moment cry. But my grandfather did maybe one minute before releasing, okay, I will see what's happening. If you are outside and the younglings hear help, probably all the grown up will just drop what they do and accord to safety. 
Still, the cells must be reconstructed to various elements by the receiver, in this situation by me. I know that there is a danger, but I still don't know why. What exactly is the danger? And I still have to identify the wasp and probably freeze again, but we have gained a few fraction of second. And in the Y, in an evolutionary, array, few fraction of second, something is the thing that is the difference between your death and you survive, you are able to reproduce. Thank you, one darling point for you. But let's see how it can be more complex. Imagine right now we are, if you are, I want to say, my little brother is seven years old. He's the age I was at this moment. And he is able to condom and make a lot of animals. He is able to emit a complex sign. I would say always symbolical because perhaps an exception exists. I can't find about it right now, but perhaps with a semi specific destination, that means it's not really me. If anywhere and anybody else can help him, it will be okay also. And still, I have to reconstruct a part of the sense, so maybe it will be complex. What does that mean? It could have scream, help a wasp. Yeah, at this moment, I am already trying to fight because I know what the danger is and I know that in this situation it's the fight trigger that I have to respond. So again, one step again, maybe I will still freeze because that's not a wasp. Something lied to me. Oh, my brain was not ready for that. But still we are gaining fraction of second. And then you have what we will be called ultra specific alarm code with a complex, with a specific destination and the sensing complete. Imagine that my little brother understands that there is something that looks like a wasp, but he's old enough to know that it's not a wasp. So he could say, a giant wasp or something. And by hearing that, I know that, okay, I have to fight and it's a wasp, maybe, maybe it's bigger than a wasp. I, I will right now grab the bigger storm I can find, even before I open around. So that means that at this moment, we always gain evolutionary advantage, even if it's more and more complex. So right now, imagine this complexity and this add-on of complexity through generation on, on thousands of individuals, and you will see the advantage you can have. To have an idea, this kind of specific alarm call is what you can find on suricat or on vervet monkeys. They have a specific call to, dis to distinguish specific predator because you are not defending yourself against different kind of predator of the same kind. If they are screaming the alarm call for eagle, you are not uh, hiding in the branch of the trees where you are the most exposed. But if you are screaming the alarm call for terrestrial predator, like a jaguar or so on, it makes sense. Having this is a lot of survival rate. And here, it's also something we can find on all the way on the suricat. The suricat have what we can call a kind of imperative that is a sign that is, um, I would say, functioning uh, the, the specific alarm call that designed the degree of emergency right now. Uh, I am a, the suricat who is guarding the nest. I see a, a snake on one. I call for a snake. I saw a snake near a youngling. I call for a snake. Right now, we have to fight guys. That's not the same level. And this ultra specific is also a good way to save your energy. You are not fighting if the snake is just there. You are looking at it and being vigilant and cautious. That's okay. But you are not fighting. Here you are fighting. So, in all this situation, we can see how when we think about the continuity of the language, we are able to see how this construction is uh, probably evolving. How it's evolving. Indeed, if we are looking at the language from our point of view and compare it only with the amoeba, it can see to be a gap. But here we can see how it can be used in different species for different needs. Social species that have a very short life expan doesn't really need to have, I would say, ultra-specific alarm call. But when you are a species like us, like most of the primates, that spend years and years and years 
to rise up younglings. You don't have a younglings to be killed before he is able to reproduce. It's a complete evolutionary waste. So you see how the cultural evolution, the biological evolution, and probably the language evolution are stepping and stepping together. There's never, in, in, in what I know, there is never one thing leading to another. It's always a coevolution. And it's really interesting to see how this coevolution happened in different species than how. So what can we conclude, I would say, of this part? Um, it is important to see that definition of language is arbitrary. None of the definition we've seen before is really made of. Is it a bad thing? No, it's only a bad thing if we say it's arbitrary and then only one possible and it's the truth. Because we need a category to study things. If we are speaking again about here and this specific alarm call, different stations, what is a species? What are species? What are the definition of species? Species are technically the moment when two individuals cannot reproduce or they are the sterile offspring. The lion and the tiger are two different species, even if they can reproduce, is because the league are always sterile. But we see how this definition is fragile. Some mutation, someday, if one leg suddenly is fertile, we have to say that tiger and lion are the same species? Ah, that's an old. What is important to understand is that there is no definition of long word. There can be different definition of language, all arbitrary, that just serve a purpose of our study, but we have to acknowledge it at different categories for studying different things. Every work, including a study of limits of language, border of language, evolution of language, category of language, should always include a definition that will be the reference point for this work and probably for this work only. And that's not a problem to not always agree on definition. For example, this is the one I use in my own work. Language, the aptitude to voluntarily communicate using any complex sign system proper to a specific community. Why is it relevant? Because I'm studying communication in social spaces, so I need a specific community. Uh, I'm studying high level of complexity, so I need a complex sign system, and I need it to differentiate between simply communication. And I'm studying the animal agency, so I need this point on voluntarily communicate. In communication, there is also a lot of things that are not voluntary, clearly, but they are, I would say, add-on to the language. They were not language in the definition I use, in the definition I need. As any evolutionary tool, the continuity is both almost mandatory and difficult to demonstrate. In my uh, knowledge, there is no one single evolutionary tool or ability that just appear out of nowhere one day like this. All these ability are long construction of the evolution. And sometimes they appear multiple times in different branch. The uh, learning is something that is really important in the primate branch, but it's also a major way of learning in octopus that are quite far away from us. And it is also very difficult to demonstrate because abilities like emotion, like cognition, uh, does not leave for sight. You can only say, okay, we are this evolution of this kind of behavior, and you think that for this behavior, we need this ability. But that's all. Clearly, when you are studying at the border of an ability, you have to be very careful of the definition and always think, what is the definition for? Here I will argue again for the continuity of that, but I will completely understand what people who prefer a very, I would say more arbitrary definition if they need it for their study. I just think that clearly it's need to be addressed are a choice of research and not as I would say a truth in research. And I will let here a lot of lecture 
Uh, I'm absolutely sorry. Most of them, not most of them, some of them are in French because I couldn't find the, the part of English. So yeah, if you need some part of it, maybe I will translate a bit, but uh, clearly not all of them uh, will be available for you. And I apologize for that. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Very good. Uh, um, uh, maybe you should. Um... Yeah, we already have one question. Oh, okay. Oscar, 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 Oscar is always the fastest. <laughs> um, Thank you, Pauline, for your presentation. It was uh, awesome to listen. Uh, yeah, some things that I maybe already had an intuition of. Or that I had like floating in my mind, but it's so good to see that somebody is putting it into words in one way or another. Uh, anyhow, my question would be more uh, to invite you to share or elaborate more on this idea, uh, whether society precedes language acquisition. Uh, can we speak of pre-linguistic societies? And if so, uh, how does that relate to the previous talk, uh, where we can speak about animal societies without necessarily speaking about language? Um, clearly, if you are talking about society, you are, except if the definition of society is also problematic, that could be, that could be also. Mm -hmm. um, you are talking about a quite high level of complex organization. And for this level of complexity, you need to have a complex way of communication also. So maybe we can talk about pre-linguistic, that's, uh, that's possible, but I think we have to be very cautious of what we call uh, society, because society implicate a lot of organization and exchange between individuals. Uh, some people sometimes call about, uh, talk about, sorry, about society and organization between uh, trees and roots of the trees and the fungus that are living inside. I, well, like a symbiosis, you know, of society, I think it's not a, a good way of the word, but again, it depends on the, the definition and what you apply in the definition of society. Um, clearly in the animal kingdom, at least, at the exception, perhaps, of the social insect, I don't think you can uh, talk uh, about animal society without talking of at least uh, pre-linguistic uh, society. Uh, Great. I think, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the social immunoptera and social ants, perhaps there is an exception but clearly I am out of my specialty right now. So I think people that are working in artificial intelligence on this point could have an uh, uh, interesting point because uh, a lot of these people are also studying the way this society communicates in order to improve some, um, the, the way some uh, matching calculate. So they could be also interesting thing. But uh, again, the only person I know working in this way is uh, is a French researcher, and and French I don't very good with foreign language, so I don't know how we can talk with him. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great presentation. I like, yeah, explaining everything about language, but animals do have like their own way of language, like their own communication. Like I have a dog, like, and he, uh, like, we have this like diaper for him where he does his business. And when he, he's, I don't know how, but he, he knows to do the business on that diaper. Mm -hmm. Like when he does his business, on the, the, the diaper he gets a reward. But when he does when he does does business somewhere around the house, he starts to run because he knows he's going to get punished. Yeah. So they have their way of playing to understand. It's um, I would say here uh, we are not uh, in a way of language. We are in a way of I would say more uh, emo emotion projection. Uh, because you won't have this answer in a dog that is not living in a house, for example. Uh, the reason he has uh, this kind of reaction 
is because he is learning through your emotion. Because obviously, when he does that, you are furious. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's not a, it's a very interesting and sometimes also very complex aspect. But it's not in the river of the language per se. It's more like shared emotion and. Another thing that uh, dogs and other uh, domestic species like like cats, like horse uh, and donkeys a lot are very good at is reading emotion on uh, the body language and the face language of human being. They are really, really good at that. Um, and in my own here, we are more in the kind of uh, learning by emotion, by emotion sharing. Thank you. So, uh, any more questions here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi, Pauline. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are lagging a bit, but uh, we are hearing. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, this is one of the favorite topics at our department. So, it was great contribution. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, something more about the recursivity criteria because you uh, enumerated all those criteria uh, language specific in the traditional literature and recursivity was one of those. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to speak honestly, personally for me, I'm not convinced about that one. We had a great discussion on this back in 2017 uh, in gatherings in Lausanne. Yeah. And um, so my question is, do you know someone else besides Everett who, who um, dealt with the topic of the recursivity as, as human language specific? Because I only know about Everett. And um, so, but uh, do you just uh, finish that? that remark about gatherings in Lausanne, our conclusion back uh, there was that we have recursivity in um, non-human communication, for example, at the level of metabolic cycles, at the cellular uh, communication level, for example, is the lowest maybe level of recursivity. So, uh, yeah, my question is whether you know someone else besides Everett, because his argument about, about the Piranha language is, is very highly controversial, uh, at least for linguists. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so you were lagging a bit, so I hope uh, I had everything and, uh, and I will try to, to answer with that. Um, I have to uh, check a bit because obviously the, the Pira were the, I would say maybe most famous because they were the first, but to my knowledge, they were not the only one. And uh, I, I will have to do a bit more, um, uh, Zotero is a mess and I really need to do something about it. <laughs> but um, in my uh, in knowledge, I, I will have to, to go after that, but, uh, they were not the only one. They were famous because they were the first and because there were all these arguments with Chomsky and so on. But I do remember they were not the only one. And, uh, and uh, uh, in, my, um, in my opinion of this, it, what is interesting is that perhaps recursivity was something we thought a neither cell because again, uh, in Europe, our language are in fact descending from exactly the same family or very close family. And we didn't think about something that was really, I would say, far away from our knowledge and our use and our cultural own evolution. Um, so it didn't uh, surprise me when I learned that. So I don't think I, um, I bother to note everything, but uh, I will do uh, a bit of uh, investigation in my own notes and my own biography. And uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Perhaps we can put it in the description of the YouTube uh, replay uh, or something uh, like this. We can, we can do that. Okay, so I will do a bit of investigation and uh, I will put a comment whether if I have it, I will put a reference or two. And if I don't have it, I say, okay, well, maybe here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That will be useful because I'm really interested in this. And if, if you find some something more, uh, I will really want to read that. Yeah, oh, obviously. Um. Yeah. Uh, Josh, please. Hmm? 
Um, yeah, that was great. Um, I'm really fascinated with, I'm, I'm not sure how much uh, you'll have to say about this, but I'm hoping that, that you'll have some opinions about um, uh, reflexivity so that um, I fully agree with your sort of a, a, a original claim that, um, that well, I, I I think that creativity veritable, creativity veritable, semiosis goes all the way down to single cells at least, if, if not, maybe even a little further. Um, but I, I do want to explore how it is there's a, that humans um, and, then, and then maybe some primates and some birds are distinct in, in their level of reflexivity, in particular, their ability to generate just profuse numbers of signs. Um, and the, the kinds of abstraction that are related to reflexiveness um, and, and, then, and then the ability, like I said, to, to generate in, in, in any given moment, just a, 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 yeah, an amazing number of signs, um, almost maybe too much for humans, <laughs> which is you know, maybe an interesting conversation in and of itself. But what is, your, from your perspective, from you know, maybe linguistics or, or your studies, um, do you have any comments on any bodies of work that, that comment on, on those distinctions? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have no problem when someone say that, for example, if you are following the uh, Jacobson uh, function of language, that some of these function maybe are unique to human, uh, like the poetic function of the language, maybe. Uh, it's not my specialty, so I, I'm focusingly like this, but uh, for me, that would not be a problem uh, and not an issue even on the methodological part, because uh, when you are graduating, obviously, you are, um, I, don't, I don't like the, the, the idea of adding complexity and adding categories, because mm -hmm. it's, well, it's, it's not like this exactly in biology, but um, yes, you are creating at least new things uh, through the evolution. And yeah, maybe some of these things only appear in some very particular branch or very particular species. And well, that won't be, I think, an uh, issue. If you say to me that maybe the metacognitive function of the language, metalinguistic function of the language is proper to human, yeah, probably. But it won't be enough to do a definition of language because I am also very sure that perhaps some group of humans don't have this function and they are not least able to have language for you. What is problematic, I think, is when you have a definition you're trying to apply as human can do this and whole human can do this and only human can do this. It has this moment we have, I think, something that's always tricky. Um, and it was also, uh, I would say, a kind of dark past because this kind of very broken definition also was used sometimes to justify discrimination uh, against all the population that was seen as primitive, not as human as we were. And I think that these definitions are not good scientifically speaking, and they can even be dangerous on ethical speaking for humans and for animals. So, but no problem with specific category. Uh, I mean, there are specific branch and yeah, of course specific thing can happen if you say that yeah, you know what, uh, humans are the only one able to build the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, the <laughs> American don't, buy, don't build it. They are humans still. But <laughs> it, it, yeah. you are talking right now a very particular, very specific part of the humanity. But it's not a problem because you say, okay, only them did that. And that doesn't mean that all of them have to be able to do that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, do, do we have any more? I, I don't see, but maybe I don't see anyone. Uh, I don't know if I can see everyone. Okay, well, but, uh, I have a question. Yeah. And uh, uh, okay, so how to how to put it? Um, so you were you were talking about uh, double articulation as this uh, like this criterion that might not be very good for mm -hmm. defining uh, language and then uh, or well, yeah specificity of language but um, and I, I I sort of agree but uh, well this theory of double articulation in, in general has been sometimes it is it's often attacked by by semioticians as 
like a very bad thing to do. <laughs> now, my question is, uh, uh, I, what I think, it, and, and the question would be whether or not you agree. My question is that uh, while double articulation might not, might not be like a good uh, criterion for defining human specific language, the uh, whole idea of articulation might be helpful to give an account of communicative system. And it might be even better to talk about different degrees of articulation than of syntax. Uh, but what do you think? And because uh, this, of course, comes from a purely linguistic uh, uh, yeah. theory. So, um, uh, it's yeah. also that double articulation is a good way to define all speech, technically. But the point is that oral speech is not language. So it's a kind of, the, the problem with that is, it's not defining the good thing we try to define, but it's a good way to study your oral speech, for example. So again, if we can turn it in the right section, it can be a valuable tool to study things. Uh, it's not that, it's not the good tool if we want to study a broader creation of language, but for oral and vocal speech, it's a really interesting tool. I don't know if it's relevant in all the language because, um, well, as I say, French I bad for a language, I'm French I bad for a language, so I don't speak much of them. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's relevant in all the, the culture and all the, the language in human language, but it seems to me that it's a quite useful tool. It's not just the tool we need for this work when we are talking about language, so that's all. Okay. Okay, but double articulation as a whole, but not necessarily to think about because you, you can think of this. We can we can also of... think about this kind of articulation and um, the whole sign articulation. Having a sign for an entire word is not the kind of articulation, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's in this situation, it's a broader tool that we have for a broader question. But yeah, we need to we need to build a broader tool for address broader question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm a methodologist. I love constructing too. <laughs> okay, You're very good. So, uh, any more questions? Um, maybe also from here in the in the room. We have a small uh, small audience uh, also tonight. Uh, yeah. Well, but um, well, if there are no more questions, um, we'll just. Thank Pauline again. And, and thank you for boring me. Uh, because yeah, I think this was really one of our, one of the best uh, sessions we have had <laughs> in the whole. Yeah, please listen. Well, this is, okay, it was a very good session. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, well, thank thank you all of you again for for coming. And uh, I would only remind you that uh, in two weeks we are going to have our third session. Uh, oh, it's okay. okay. And uh, for our third session, we are going to have uh, uh, Musaji and Timo Man uh, for uh, as, as speakers. So it should be also a very, very nice uh, uh, session continuing with the uh, echo semiotic and sol semiotic uh, discussion. So, uh, well, see you then uh, in two weeks. And thanks again to every of you for being here and for presenting. And uh, yeah, remember you can always write to us uh, via Facebook or on an email or whatever, and we are there for helping you with anything that we can. So yeah, thank you, <laughs> and have a nice evening. Uh -huh. I was supposed to do something on here.